God, thank you so much for this opportunity to get together and fellowship and uh, take a look at your word. Lord, we pray that, as always, that you give us insight in your word, that you give us wisdom. Help us to um, sharpen one another, challenge one another. And Lord, we pray that you would just use these passages that we get into to build excitement and uh, watch, as Paul says, for the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us to get excited about that, Lord, and, and um, be ready. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. So what we get into in, in chapter 14, though, is uh, a little bit of a, a different angle in the sense that it is still parenthetical, and it's going to show us what's coming. And when we look at what's coming in Revelation 14, it's going to give us kind of a heavenly perspective in some respects, because um, God is going to be telling us from that perspective and from that viewpoint how things are settling out um, right here at the start of the bold judgments. And from there, how things are going to end up. So a lot of these start off where we're at, kind of. And they say, and this is how it ends up. So it's going to go into the 144,000. How does, what's coming with them? The proclamations of three angels that are in this chapter and what they're proclaiming and what it portends to. And then we have reaping going on um it mentions really two different types of reaping is reaping the earth's harvest and it is given as like a grain or wheat type of a reaping but then it's followed up immediately by the trampling of grapes of wrath and it's interesting because opinions on this will vary uh for instance, a lot of your study Bibles, it'll just kind of, oh, and John Wilver even. John Wilver, John MacArthur, they'll just kind of lump together as one at um, these reapings, like they're all reapings of judgment. I kind of have a different perspective on this, and you might disagree, but I, when we get there, indulge me a little bit and see if you agree or not, because um, I think... Um, that's not necessarily the, the case. That's not necessarily the way to read it, and then I'll show you why. But the first thing we want to do here is, in uh, Revelation 14 is let's take a look at the 144,000 and what's going on there. Remember the 144,000 were revealed to us back in um, chapter 7, right? And in chapter 7, they come onto the scene, and they're sealed. They have the seal of God on their forehead, and they go out as witnesses for God. And a lot of people say that they're like 144,000, you know, commandos for the Lord and out witnessing and this kind of a thing. And I don't know exactly what that's going to look like, but they're witnesses for Christ and they stand with them no matter what. But so let's look at these first handful of verses here. Um, Revelation 14, starting with verse 1. Then I left and behold on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps, and they were singing a new song before the throne, and before the four living creatures, and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. And in the mouth no lie or no guile was found, for they are blameless. There's a lot in there to, to really unpack because there's a lot of things that may, might leave you kind of scratching your head. But let's, let's take a look at verse 1. First thing to notice is 
Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him the 144,000. Now, some people will want to try to place this as right here in the middle of the book at the beginning of the Great Tribulation, as though the 144,000, now they've somehow been translated to heaven, and they're standing on a Mount Zion that's up there in heaven. And um, I don't think that that's what the passage says, because I can't recall anywhere where there's ever a separate kind of a rapture for the 144,000. Or, though they've been sealed, they would have to have died to go up there and be in heaven. So, a Mount Zion in heaven, I don't really see in this passage. Uh, but some people will insist, that just so you know that that's a position. But here's, here's the way I look at this, and that is, um, Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, with him, the 144,000, who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the war of many waters. So um, John is on earth, so it's his perspective, and he's seeing them on Mount Zion, on earth, the Mount Zion. And he's the voice he's hearing is from heaven. So he's not saying it like, I was there before the throne, and I saw the beast and everything that was there. And, you know, um, then, you know, God spoke, and this is what his voice sounded like. He's hearing this voice from heaven. So it's more like he's, um, in my opinion, this is a glimpse at how the 144,000 end up at the very end of the Great Tribulation. So um, Christ has returned, in this case. He's standing on Mount Zion, and he's with the 144,000 um, by this point. Then there's this voice from heaven, and, and we know this is God's voice because this is similar to so many times we've read this before, right? And whether, whether we're going back to Daniel or whether we're looking here in Revelation, like the war of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps, so... He's hearing this, he's not seeing anybody playing harpists, but he's hearing this musical quality, and I don't know if this is angels singing, making noise, playing instruments, or what it's doing, but it's, it's music that he's hearing from heaven. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. And um, he tells us that no one could learn that song except 144,000. So this is a unique song that's specially for the 144,000. I assume other people were there trying to figure it out and saying, how can they, you know, or maybe it can be sung a certain way that only they can sing it, or I don't know how complex the lyrics have to be where only they can learn the song. It's kind of interesting, but it's a special song that's for the 144,000 singing their praises to God. So it's for the 144,000 who've been redeemed from the earth Verse 4, it is these who have not defiled themselves with women. Now, in the context of marriage, we know that um, men and women being together is not a defilement. Um, but nothing says anything about them being married. This is not new. Jeremiah was forbidden to marry. I think it means what it says. A lot of people will read into it that, well, what they mean is... Um, you know, they were virgins in the sense that, uh, you know, they were pure on the earth with all the corruption going on the earth. Well, I think that's true too, but I think it says uh, they didn't defile themselves with women because I think from what we read in the book of Revelation, especially during the tribulation period, that that is a very common thing. And it keeps getting mentioned. They did not repent of their sorceries, which is the drug abuse and so forth, and their fornications and all of their other things. Well, these guys didn't. They didn't get involved in that. And um, they didn't marry. Um, remember the war, one of the woes Jesus said is, you know, for instance, is um, one of those women who give suck in that day. In other words, if they've got babies and they're nursing, it's not going to be a time of, in history, future history, to be on the run and to be nursing babies and so forth. And um, I'm thinking God in his wisdom and calling them to be the 144,000 virgins is because they're concentrating on the work of the Lord. Remember, this is one of Paul's um, exhortations, the advice he gave in 1 Corinthians, I believe it's chapter 7, 
where he's talking about, you know, if you can, if you can go on and not be married, you know, you're doing a good thing because then you can be, you can have undivided attention and devotion to the Lord and his work and his service. Um, obviously that gets divided up if, you know, it's better to marry than to burn. In other words, you, you, it's better to get married than to burn in, um, you know, due to lust and so forth. So he says, though, so if you can get by without getting married, you've done a good thing. This is what Paul said in First Corinthians. So I think it's kind of a bundle of all those kinds of things together. It's just not a opportune time. In uh, strong about standard, but it's hard to know. And the first one's about women, and then number two, it says, a man who has abstained from all uncleanliness and boredom attended on idolatry, and so has kept his chastity. And then A, one who has never had an yeah, so that sounds like both. And we, and we know that that uh, fornication is a type of a term that God has used since Old Testament days with respect to worshiping false gods, false idols. And um, in fact, Jeremiah chapter 3, at one point, God is telling Israel, because you have gone a whoring after other gods, I have written you a bill of divorce. So he uses that same marriage and whoredom type of language with respect to false gods and false worship um, ever since the Old Testament days. So it says what it, it means, I think, and it means what it says. I, I don't think there's any reason to question it otherwise. Um, so verse 4, it's these who have not de defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins, it is these who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. You can't always do that if you're married and you're tied down and you have family ties, right? These have been redeemed from mankind as firstfruits for God and the Lamb, and in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. The other thing to point out, too, is they're standing on Mount Zion, kind of mission accomplished at the end of the tribulation in my opinion. So this is Mount Zion on the earth, because he says, I heard a voice from heaven, but John's hearing the music from heaven. He doesn't actually see the players, but he says, it sounds kind of like harps. And they were sealed, so they um, didn't die. They were under God's special protection during the tribulation period. So they didn't die. Notice that there's 144,000, not 143,999. So not even one of them didn't make it. So they all passed through and made it because they were all sealed. So this is the victory, I think, at the very end. Um, the Lamb is standing on earth, and it has to be at the end. It has to be at the end, right? It come back until then. Revelation chapter 19. Yeah. And in fact, he's got a few other places to go before he gets to Zion. So I think what he's showing here is what's coming up with and um, some other things. He's kind of catching us up and picking us up with uh, some other events that are going to be accomplished by the end of the tribulation because he's getting ready now to go into the bowls and we're going to look at Armageddon. We're going to look at the destruction of the whole earth. We're going to look at Antichrist. Um, Scorched Earth's policy and how that plays out. Some people will guess, here's another thought, some people will guess that because we're in multiple multiple dimensions, we know this, physicists have said this, um, Scientific American came out with an article saying that, you know, we're, we exist in a simulation, they figured out mathematically and so forth, that we exist in a giant simulation. There could be some overlap of dimensions and that there is a Mount Zion in heaven and on earth. Um, maybe. Um, I don't know. I don't even know that you need to go there, but just so you know, that that's, that is another, another perspective. You know, like a multiverse kind of a deal. But uh, like I said, the language to me is kind of, um, you know, he hears the voice from heaven and he's, John is here on earth. Either way, with respect to heaven, heaven is wherever God dwells, right? Wherever he tabernacles is heaven. If, uh, you know, he makes his throne here, then, you know, this will be heaven for us as well because it's God's dwelling place. 
Is, it, did, uh, is, is that clear at all? Any questions about any of that? Comments? Kind of make sense? So the next thing we'll look at, look at, see we've got this column here on one side I think is, um, which I didn't point out before, but on one side I think there's some events that is that are being outlined, outlined that refer to or pertain to the blessed, and then some other events that happen that clearly call out or are marked off for the damned. So with respect to the proclamation of the angels, in uh, verses 6 to 13, we'll take a look at that because um, this is kind of interesting. This is what we've referred to before, and it's kind of hard to wrap our minds, I think, around, or me anyway, I'll speak for myself, about what this looks like with angels flying around and, and delivering messages for God at this particular time in history. Verse 6, then I saw another angel. And so you know that's Alos. Again, it's it's uh, another of the same kind of angels. We've been having this parade of angels ongoing throughout the book of Revelation, delivering messages and doing things and and blasting out of horns and trumpets and doing all kinds of things like that. And we're about to see a bunch more um, opening or pouring some bowls. And we saw some delivering woes, right? Proclaiming woes. So here we see another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to who? To those who dwell on the earth, so to the earth dwellers. So he's making a proclamation to the earth dwellers. The earth dwellers is a particular kind of language that we keep seeing that refers to the lost, the unbelievers on the earth. And, and now, is it to a certain location? Again, this has to do with um, Satan's reach, the Antichrist reach, the Antichrist beast, the reach of his kingdom on the whole earth. It says, he's proclaiming it to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. We looked at this a little bit last week, is that it's a, a global type of a, a kingdom. And he said with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. So here is a, an exhortation or an admonishment to worship God because judgments come and I don't know this is probably kind of a last chance kind of a thing as he's telling them judgments come. It doesn't say here whether this is at the middle or the somewhere within the, the great tribulation or at the end. Um, I take it to where this is just sometime in the Great Tribulation. This is in this period here. We have three different angels here in these verses. So it could be that we see the this first angel, because it says first. Yeah, I don't think it's just necessarily the way he's going to comment. So, well, the first angel I'm going to comment on was saying this, and the next angel I want to tell you about is this guy, and there was a third angel too, and he was doing this, like they were all happening at the same time necessarily. Let's take it as a chronology maybe. We might revisit that and think about it, but this could be right at the beginning, and he's warning them, you know, because uh, the bulls are coming, judgment's coming, and we see this in, by chapter 15 is this big ramp up of, we kind of flash back like we did where we left off in chapter 11, remember we looked at that timeline? Where there are thunderings in heaven and lightning and getting ready to dump the balls, but wait. And we got into chapter 12, we got into chapter 13, and now we're in chapter 14, and then chapter 15, we go back into the thunders and the lightnings again, like it's going to resume where we left off in chapter 11. Yes? So, what I hear you saying is that one through five is at the end, and now this angel at six is somewhere maybe in the beginning? We're going off there? Well, no, I mean, yeah, I, I think so. We're, we're talking about different events. One is John was commenting on the 144,000. That was towards the end. Yeah, this is where they end up. He already introduced them in chapter 11. Okay, and then chapter, when he's talking about verse 6. Verse 6. And then, and so that's another time. Possibly. I don't think we're necessarily, he says, this is hard because the hour of his judgment has come. Well, we know the hour of judgment is the whole tribulation on one hand. On the other hand, the Great Tribulation starts right now with the balls, which actually kick off in chapter 16. I don't know what you tell me, but we 
maybe if we look at the other angels, like I said, and we can see that there's only two angels proclaiming the gospel. Um, this is just one angel doing this. I understand. So, the, during the rooms, yeah, I think there's some some more going on there too, flying over the earth and. It says that I saw another angel flying directly overhead. So if he's right. on Earth and he hasn't designated himself elsewhere at this point, and he's seeing another angel flying overhead, yeah, where where is this guy? If he's not one of the two, well, he's just another angel. He's just a different angel from those guys, I guess. If he doesn't identify him, certainly not by name or whatever. All he knows, he's just saying that there's another angel, and this is what he was doing. So six and seven is all that same angel that we don't know. Yeah. See, when I read it, I was thinking all of chapter 14 was at the end because when you go on to the end of 14, it's where he does the sickle and he That's true. does all that. So yeah. I just thought this was... This. And it could be. It. So if it's at the end, why would he be... And this is... I, why would he be... One last maybe. chance before they... Maybe, or maybe it's not as a... Um, it's kind of like, think of... Um, in Ephesians, when Christ, when his body was in the tomb, and he went to paradise, Hades and the old vernacular is divided, and it says that he went and he preached to the spirits in prison. Right, preached means he's preaching the gospel because they're doomed, but it's to proclaim the victory. Here it might be the same kind of thing as he's making a declaration. I go, uh, because what is he saying? I don't want to read into more than what it is. You make up your own minds. But he's saying here, the hour of judgment has come. Now, the hour of judgment, we know, is Old Testament language that particularly has to do with everything from Daniel's 70th week, and it goes all the way into the millennium and those first events. But even beyond that, we get into the great white throne judgment because he makes some statements that have to do with great white throne judgments about the end and the hour of judgment. So hour can be almost like a literal hour or it can be a figurative hour. So he might be, these, this particular angel that he saw might be talking about almost literally an hour, the final hour, the last literal hour. And he's saying, this is it, folks. So um, it's hard telling. I like that. And the fact this... The New King James says preach, but the other ones say proclaim, and that makes a lot of sense if he's doing the same thing as, you know, captivity captive. He was getting ready to take them, so it wasn't, you know, he's proclaiming. And proclaiming a victory, yeah. Yeah, and that might be kind of what he's doing here, and then you've got the patterns, which God works in patterns. So like exactly. Well, let's look what the other two angels say, and, or what happens with them, and uh, see if we come up with anything different at all. So another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great, she who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. So that again reads like that could fit at the very end of the tribulation, right? Because he's proclaiming the fall of Babylon that is crumbled. And remember, Babylon is doesn't refer to just, um, you know, what we might call mystery Babylon, just the religious system. But think of what Babylon meant in the Old Testament. You had the very first world dictator, Nimrod, um, from Babel, and that's where the Tower of Babel was, right? And he established his kingdom, and it was... His, look what his reach, what he was attempting to do with the Tower of Babel. What was he trying to do? He's trying to ascend to the Most High like Satan almost. He wanted to build a tower in heaven. So this is, I think, really emblematic of what Babylon was all about. Whether this is literal Babylon in Iraq, where that city was or not, we know that this is a global system again. And so this is what we're looking at here is because it says here, Babylon the Great, she made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Now let's, let's take a look at, uh, at the next one because there's another, a third, starting in verse 9. 
And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full, uh, full strength into the cup of his anger. Let's stop right there just a second, because there he, it's like he, it's at the very beginning of the Great Tribulation, like he's telling you what will happen if you do this. So this isn't doesn't read to me like it's an end thing. So this third angel John's looking at now is right at the beginning, and he's making a proclamation. You do this, you participate in um, worshiping the beast to take its mark, this is what's going to happen to you. You're doomed. So let's start again with what the angel is saying. He's saying, if anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, pour full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and suffer in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. Interesting, isn't it? So see how the timing there reads a little bit different, because it says, I will, or you, uh, he also will, so that sounds kind of future. Oh, but I still, um, I still think, it, um, you know, we can disagree, of course, but I still think it goes along with, he's just proclaiming that was the law. If anyone, and, and that was before, be. and before in Revelation, you know, we're talking about the mark of the beast, and he's saying if anyone does this, and so he's reading out their, what they're guilty of. So he says with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in its image and receives a mark on his forehead, so he's proclaiming to them that they've already blown it, like it's already a done deal, and they're just now figuring it out? Yeah. I mean, maybe. I don't know. I thought it was more like a warning. I read it as a warning too. It, it doesn't really say, it doesn't really quote directly. Um, it's kind of like got echoes of Revelation 13. So he might be reiterating and restressing what was already warned in Revelation 13 at the beginning of the Great Tribulation. So you could look at it that way too. Look at verse 8 though, where it says, Follow me, Babylon. Past tense. Past tense, exactly. It's already happened. Yeah. So now this, you know, he will maybe, okay, now is the time for judgment. Right. This is what's going to happen. Because yep. like, in, like you said in Ephesians, he goes down into captivity and proclaims to them, and then he brings up and does. So this would follow along that pattern again of mm -hmm. this is where we're at. Babylon, you know, Babylon has fallen. All of you that took the mark, this is what's going to happen because we haven't quite armed the judgment. Yeah. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. and it sh seems like the whole chapter should be on the same timeline instead of skipping. That it works better that way, doesn't it? Yeah. Usually, it usually, if it does move around a little bit, there are better markers in place than yeah. that. So, no, you know, I think you're all sharp and attentive and alert to these things, and it's I, I, I think there's some good insights. Yeah. At what point do they take the mark? They don't take the mark until there is one, and there has to be the abomination of desolation, and they set this image up in the temple, and that happens in the middle of the week, which is also what we read in Daniel. So that's the abomination of desolation, is right in the middle of the tribulation week. That kicks off the great tribulation. I would point out, too, that some people will go take this, and we'll pair it with 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where the man of sin is revealed and say, really, the man of sin is not really revealed for who he is until you have the abomination of desolation. And really, he desecrates the temple not until the middle of the tribulation week. But I would think, too, that there are a lot of other cues, like the fact that you finally have this temple, <laughs> this, you know, this third temple, He's got to be here somewhere, and you have this great leader raising up, and he's trying to make himself out to be a messiah or the messiah. That's another clue. So there's a lot of clues beforehand that people ought to be keying off going, oh, this might be the man of perdition that the scripture warns of, but he's revealed 
in Second Thessalonians chapter two, that language, um, when he stands in the temple making himself to be God. So, false prophet is involved here. Remember, uh, now he's the Antichrist beast because Satan's possessed him. He's been kicked out of heaven. Michael stood up. There's been this big war in heaven. He gets kicked down to earth. Um, that harkens back to one of the first things he does, and I don't know which one happens first. I, I suspect that Satan, that Antichrist possessed by Satan, or maybe even before he possesses Antichrist, Satan comes and kills the two witnesses. There's a couple possibilities there. But that's in Revelation chapter 11. He kills the two witnesses. Could be that he kills the two witnesses just as Satan, or he first possesses Antichrist. Um, that's very telling. But then somewhere in there, probably the next thing he would do, and I would say it's the next thing because the two witnesses are going to be there breathing fire and calling down fire from heaven, whatever they want to do. They're there at the temple. What are they they're going to be protecting the temple or whatever? Well, he's going to get them out of the way. They're on the outside. Comes in, takes out the two witnesses, which only lasts three and a half days, uh, and then um, goes in and desecrates the temple. That all can happen within a 24-hour period. The false prophet snare makes this image um, just like the Antiochus uh, Epiphanes did with Zeus, erecting Zeus, a statue of him in the holy place, and slaughtering pigs on the altar, that kind of thing. So the Antichrist does all this and he causes the uh, sacrifices to cease. Remember, we got all that in, in, in uh, Daniel chapter 9. So the, along with that, he introduces, within a very short amount of time, this, this beast system, this numerical system, where now this is the new thing. Everybody's got to worship the beast. If you want to eat again, trade, anything like that again, you got to take his name or his mark, the number of his name, not yours, not your personal data and information, not a chip with all your data on it. You've got to take his number, his mark, on your right hand or on your forehead. And that works hand in hand with the worship of the beast. So let me ask you something. If somebody holds somebody down and forces the mark on their forehead or on their hand, are they lost? Are they damned? No, it's a heart issue, right? It's always a heart issue. The thing is, is worship, you've got to say, I, you know, um, I can either follow the creator of the universe and worship him, but I like to keep buying my toys and have my stuff and have access to the internet and be able to buy food and be able to travel. So, you know, no big whip. Yeah, I'll go ahead and put it, put it right here. No, you know what? I've got a cool face piercing. I also want a tattoo to go with it. Put it there, and you got to worship the beast. So all of those come together. So it's not one system or the other. The, um, I'm taking, a, getting a chip, getting a tattoo, um, or silly barcode or some of the things people come up with. But it's supposed to be barcode, really. Remember that? People talk about that a lot in the 70s and 80s. Oh. Um, or an RFID chip and voluntarily having it implanted, those in and of itself is not going to damn you. It's the worship of the beast you have to do to take the mark. They work together. It will tie into your bank account. It will tie into your personal data at some point. Um, however, when they make those two systems talk, however they make them work together, but it's his number, his name that... Uh, because you're aligning yourself with him. So you're no, damned forever if you do that. Nobody's going to accidentally take the mark. Oops, I didn't know. Yeah. And now right. I'm, now I'm damned forever. Yeah. What? That, that was worship? Sure? No. So once they take the mark, they're, they're done. Like, they're not, there's not a chance. Stick a fork in them, they're done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we have this language in, throughout Revelation 2, and it started at the very end of chapter 9 where, you know, and the rest of mankind didn't repent. They just didn't repent. We see this period of time 
is Daniel's 70th week. It's also the time of Jacob's trouble. It's the prophetic time clock that's been stopped a couple thousand years ago for Israel. This is it starting again. This is um, God starting the prophetic time clock for Israel and picking up where he left off. And, and you see God is saving his remnant out of Israel. Will all Israel be saved? No, as we're about to find out um, in a while that that's not the case at all. In fact, when you read in Zechariah where, um, and Micah, interestingly enough, there's some of this language too, where God goes before them and leads them into the wilderness. And you find in Zechariah that one third of a remnant of Israel goes into um, the mountains to hide out and be protected by God. But then the rest that remain behind fall in judgment. They're into the whole, God judges Israel too. And we don't find this real prevalent in here in these scriptures, but I was reading Micah this weekend, which is an interesting, it's one of the minor prophets, you should read it, but there's this language about the last hour and what God does um, to Israel to judge them for getting involved with Babylon and going after her false idols and, and the judgment and stuff. So there's some in Israel, some Jews, who are totally wrapped up in this beast system and they're going to be judged, just like they were in the Old Testament. So God is separating the wheat from the shaft. He's, he's beginning all this now and uh, setting things up for his kingdom. So first thing he's got to do is purge all the wickedness, judge the world for their sin, judge the nations for their sin, but for going against his people and his nation, his land. So all those judgments coming upon the earth, and that's what we're looking at here. Hillary, you had something to no, comment on. Okay. okay. Um, but that's a good question, how all that comes together. So looking on, oh, you verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, and I don't know if this is an angel or if this is God saying this, um, but I think it's pretty clear that it's God and it's just the Holy Spirit because of the next phrase. See, it says, I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. So it's a special blessing for those who become martyrs. Um, Blessed indeed, says the Spirit. Now, the blessed indeed, says the Spirit, might be a response to that. So it might be an angel says, um, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. And basically, the Spirit is saying, amen. He's saying, blessed indeed. So he's affirming that. That they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. So there's an extra, extra blessing. Notice the... Holy Spirit adds his agreement when he speaks. Um, we've seen this, for instance, in, in uh, Hebrews 3, verses 7 to 11, we see the Holy Spirit speaking. And it says, um, Hebrews 3, it says, Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoke me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me by testing me, and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore I was angry with this generation and said, they always go astray in their heart and they did not know my ways as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. We see the Holy Spirit also speaking in Acts chapter eight, verses 26 to 40. So, but notice how the Holy Spirit, um, he's concerning himself with their rest. Holy Spirit's ministry, he's called what? Comforter. The comforter, the paraclete, so he's a go-between. What else does the Holy Spirit do in our lives? I mean, he, he indwells us. He's, sanctifying, he's involved in the sanctifi sanctifying work in our lives, pointing to Christ, pointing us to Christ, drawing us to him, comforting us, teaching us, training us, um, He's our go-between. He, he's our guarantee. He what? He's our guarantee because we're sealed in him. 
who um, intercedes for us in our prayers with moanings and groanings which can't be uttered. So in other words, we don't always know how to pray. We don't know how the right way to approach the throne of God. We're doing good to handle God's baby talk in the Bible, right? So the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us. So notice here, it's the same kind of thing where he's saying amen about a special blessing to the saints. He's concerning himself about their labors and how their deeds follow them. The Holy Spirit moves on men's hearts, bringing them to faith, pointing to the Son, convicting of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And he moves through us in our sanctifying in, in the, as, a, as a comforter, the paraclete. Isn't that interesting, though? So as we look at this now, the next thing we're going to look at, though, is, is a couple of different reapings. Um, and, and these couple of reapings really close out the, the chapter. But here's the question about this, though, because most people will kind of bundle these together. My question is, if both are the same harvest, the same reaping of destruction, why are they described in two different ways and as two different events? And in fact, even two different angels involved in the reaping. And also, there's another question, if, if they get reaped once, who's getting reaped the second time as far as the judgment? See what I mean? Let's take a look and see. Oh, I hope to maybe clear this up. And Here's part of the problem. And I think it's part of the problem might come from um, maybe city Bible teachers and preachers who don't understand how farming works, okay? Because they look at some of the language in here, um, and they say they see judgment. Let's let's take a look. now. Granted, if you're alive, anybody hacked with a sickle, it's, you would think that that's going to be judgment. But in farming parlance. It's not, you know, we reap some things and they're for benefit um, because they don't have ankles and feet like we do or getting hacked off the, or at the knees or something like that. It's a different kind of a thing. So the reaping is just part of the process. You, you gather up the wheat and you take it into the barn, into the shelter. So let's take a look. Verse 14. Then I looked and behold a white cloud and seated on the cloud, one like a son of man with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Who's that probably? One like a son of man. It could be an angel. A lot of people will say it is the son of man. It's Jesus Christ on, on this cloud. Okay, so he's there. Somebody is there. Now, it could be an angel because it says, um, and another angel came out of the temple but maybe John is saying another angel came out of the temple because he's had this parade of angels and they're continuing. So it could be Son of Man, Christ on the cloud. But look, 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 here's another angel. We just saw three and here comes another angel. So here's a fourth angel right here, or, or fifth, depending on how you look at the one who looks kind of like the Son of Man on a cloud. Um, either way, he came out of this, another angel came out of the temple calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. Uh, so we have this harvest on the earth, and I want to bring your attention to... Um, the word, the word ripe, people will look at that, and the word for ripe here means uh, mature. It also means desiccated. So they're saying, well, it's ripe, it's desiccated. It means it's, you know, it's desiccated, it's all dried up, it's a husk, it's overripe. In fact, and it, it, uh, you know, you don't want to see that. And for instance, we get this as a, a derogatory term when it has to do with um, some passages in the Gospels, those passages are usually referring to grapes or fig trees because they're dried up husk and they're not supposed to be that way. They weren't big raisin fans, I guess, back in those days. But here's a newsflash that when you're, you're talking about 
um, believers, and the believers being wheat, and you have a reaping that happens that it's grain, um, it needs to be ripe, ripe in the sense of being desiccated, because that's what ripening wheat is. Uh, your farmers today, they go out and uh, it messes a lot of people up because it's this Monsanto junk and they need to stop doing it because they're messing up the crops, but they will spray their crops with a desiccant to get it to dry up because that's when you can reap. That's when you get the harvesters going and, and the desiccant to dry it out speeds the process along and it also is less work for the harvesting machine, you know, to, um, so that there's less resistance when it's breaking down the wheat and gathering the wheat up to bundle it up to be gathered up for the shelter. Well, in other words, ready to harvest, which is what you want with wheat and with grain. So the two har harvests, though, here in this passage are two different words in the Greek indicating they're not the same harvest for the same purpose. Um, the, the next passage we read mentions fire and blood and wrath. And this passage right here, it doesn't. So it's, to me, it seems to make sense that, you know, you've got a, uh, a good harvest that's going to happen because you've got believers on the earth at this time, right? And they've got to be gathered into the barn. Um, Matthew 13. Matthew 13, you can turn there if you want, verses 37 to 43. In Matthew 13, starting with verse 37, he says, he answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the, the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. Hey, there's a harvest at the end of the age. See what I mean? And the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered or burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. Because as we're about to see, these grapes are, are ripe and they're overripe and they're also going to be crushed. Matthew 13, verses 37 to 43. So verse, verse 40 again says, just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. Verse 41, the Son of Man will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and lawbreakers and throw them into the fire furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. So he's contrasting good and evil, and even in that passage. You could flip back a, a couple of chapters there in Matthew. We can look at Matthew chapter 3, where he says, um, where John the Baptist says, I baptize you with water for repentance, that he who is coming after me is mightier than I, with whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, and gather his wheat into the barn. But the shaft he will burn with unquenchable fire. So there's two different... So you got um, the believers and the unbelievers. So he's always got this contrast here. In, in Mark 4, he, there was the... There's a... Verses 26 through 29, there's a little passage there about the parable of the seed growing, and it's the same kind of... Visually, it's the same kind of language, same type of a parable here. He, and he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and he rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. So here it's a positive thing. So you want the desiccation of the crop. It's got to be ripe because that's what happens with wheat. Well, let's contrast that with what we see in the remainder of Revelation chapter 14, where it talks about the trampling of the grapes because it reads as something completely, completely different. Now notice what happens is Right away in verse 17, then another angel came out of the temple in heaven. So this is a different event. Different angel, different event. 
And he too had a shump sickle. But here's some differences, and watch these differences. I think they're key. And another angel came out of the altar, the angel who has authority over the fire, and he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the winepress of the wrath of God. So there we've got language there, and he's not, not down here with the passage, but here we've, we've got a completely different picture where they're being thrown into the wine press, the wine vat, to be trampled and squished under feet. Um, look at, um, let's see, in this second case, the word to use the sickle is a verb that means to dispatch. So it's not just a matter of harvesting, it means to, to dispatch them. So that these grapes are being dispatched, put to an end, more like the Grim Reaper. So here is this reaping is a dispatching, it's putting to an end. Joel chapter 3 is a passage we should look at. Joel chapter 3, starting in verse 11, it says, Hasten and come, all you surrounding nations, and gather yourselves here. Bring down your waters, O Lord. Let the nations stir themselves up and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. What are we talking about here? For then I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest, harvest is ripe. Go in, tread, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for their evil is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. See, it's judgment. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon are darkened and the stars withdraw their shining. Here we're looking at a Armageddon type of a scenario here, right? Look at, also you can write down with this, Jeremiah 25 verses 30 and 31. You therefore shall prophesy against them all these words and say to them, The Lord will roar from on high, and from his holy habitation utter his voice. He will roar mightily against the fold, against his fold, and shout, like those who tread grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. There's those earth dwellers again. The clamor will resound to the ends of the earth, for the Lord has an indictment against the nations. He is entering into judgment with all flesh, and the wicked he will put to the sword. Does that make sense? Any questions? I also know when he receives the word wine, the wine of God's wrath in verse 10 of chapter 14. Yep. And another angel, a third, followed him, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger. So wine, again, grapes, you're, you're correct. And he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of his holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So yeah, it's the same kind of language. Yep, that's some good insights. So continuing, and this is, the, this is how the chapter ends. And the wine press was trodden outside the city and blood flowed from the wine press as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. 1,600 stadia is roughly 160 to 170 miles. We're talking about the Valley of Megiddo, the Valley of Jehoshaphat, the Valley of Decision, as we just read in Joel. This is where Jesus tramples out the grapes. Um, when we get there, too, look, you can flip over and. Revelation 19, look at Revelation 19, verses 11 to 16. You have the rider on the white horse. With this, we'll wrap it up. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like the flame of fire, and his head on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which 
he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword which, with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of his fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty. Verse 16, on his robe and on his thigh, he has written a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And then verse 17, and I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, come and gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war with him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. So yeah, you got Armageddon. You've got all the armies of the earth gathered right there. And who are they fighting? Are they turning on each other? You know, they, they turn on the Lamb of God and his armies of angels. That's probably a, one of the most poor decisions one could ever make in life. And the beast was captured and with it the false prophet, who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. I would point out that these are the two first residents in the lake of fire. There's nobody there now. This is the first. They don't even get to go to a court, the great white throne judgment. This is their judgment right here. And the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on his on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. So this is for us where Christ is judging the nations of the earth, and then he's going to come in and he's going to um, bring about the sheep and the goats judgment which we read about in Matthew 25. And there's some more angels there because they're gathering people. And you've got um, the marriage supper of the lamb while during the, the wedding ceremony, the ancient Hebrew wedding ceremony, there's all kinds of feasting and celebration going on. During the seven year period, the Marriage supper itself, the big one, happens at the very end, and it's the public dinner that they have. And it's where the bride is introduced, behold the bride, now wife, and then her veil is removed from the public. Remember, for seven years, she has been locked up with the groom in the father's house celebrating, and it's behind closed doors. This is, he's out of the father's house now, which he is here because he's returned, and you see... The, the bride unveiled, actually we see that in Revelation 21, now wife revealed to the whole world, and then there is a celebratory dinner that happens, and the commen commencement of uh, lots of restoration that must take place because Earth, as we can see here, is going to be quite a mess by the end of all of this. And thus Christ will establish his throne in a perfect kingdom on Earth, and all things will consummate in the, the type of uh, earth that was originally intended, originally designed, I would say, in paradise back in the days of Adam and Eve, bringing with it all the promises that were for Israel from the time of Genesis. Now we're in Revelation, and now these things are going to begin to come to fruition. So now we see the focus of everything and we're, how it's all going to kind of round out by the time you get to the end of the Great Tribulation. Questions? No? Okay. All right. Well, I hope that made sense. Um, I hope the harvest thing makes sense. Let me know what you think. If you'd like to read into it more and dig during the week, let me know your thoughts on it. Um, again, you can, sometimes you've got to make up your mind on these things. You follow some notes in your Bible and Sometimes you'll agree and sometimes you'll disagree. 
Um, I want to point out real quick on this map here. Notice Edom down there on the bottom of the map. Um, let me bring this in close here like this. Edom and Moab is the old prophecy. That is where modern day Jordan is. That's where you'll find Petra. So it looks like when we look at Bible prophecy, that's probably the first place Christ comes down to the earth. He doesn't step off the earth yet. So he comes down there and he rescues those who are kind of captive in Edom and Moab, which are going to be kind of a reserve, a preserve. It'll, it'll be the uh, saints preserve <laughs> um, at the very end, surrounded by the armies with the Lord will protect them divinely. There, he'll stop there first and he'll wipe out a bunch of armies that have surrounded Petra there. And then he moves on there and he's, he's trampling out the, the grapes of his wrath there in um, that whole journey. He makes a big circle and he goes all the way up toward Megiddo, toward the top, and he's wiping people out. Um, and blood splashes, and it's going to be quite a, a horrific, horrific mess at its deepest point. The blood can be up to as deep as the bridle of, of a, a horse. And um, then he finally sets foot near Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives, and it splits. So that kind of gives you kind of a little bit of a path and insight into where he's going to be at when he first comes back. So that, that was some bonus material. It's a freebie, no charge for that, okay? The next week we venture into chapter 15, and again, that kind of picks up where chapter 11 left off with saying, okay, now the seventh trumpet, now we've got the balls coming, and there's thunder and lightnings, and all the angels are getting together. Uh, the seventh angel has blown his horn, and everybody's getting ready for this big um, final um, judgment on the earth of the bowl tr trumpets. And then we paused, and John has been spending some time here getting us up to speed on what's going on with everybody, everybody's positions from where, where they came from, what's going on, who's who, and where are they at, and what all's going on. Chapter 15, we'll pick up again and go, okay, now we're back into before the throne of God again, and we're getting ready to do these plagues, and here's the thunders and lightnings, you know. When last we saw a hero, <laughs> you know, that type of a thing, that's what the parentheticals look like. So it's all gearing up for the final plagues, which actually kick off and happen in Revelation chapter 16. Great, let's close in prayer. God, it's awesome to see what you're doing and the way this, the ends of the world is going to, to play out. And Lord, the, the, the confidence that we have that you said it's going to happen, it's as good as done. Um, and Lord, we thank you that this also applies with our own salvation. You say we're sealed in you, just like the 144,000, and they all made it to the end. We know we're going to make it to the end too because we're sealed in your Holy Spirit, God. We take peace in this. And we also pray, Lord, even so come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen.